So it's been a long week, as always. I feel like we say this every week, so... Yeah, but t- today's one of those days where it goes... I, I do feel like it, it's been it's been longer than usual. Hmm. Like, we're already at that long week part, but it's not even close to done yet. Yes. And, and yet, at the same time, it's not like an exhausting week at all. No, this is true. It just feels like it's it's been long. But I think that's just we're just getting used to being back in the swing of of mm-hmm. like the full schedule, being yeah. being back to having all the activities going and everything. That's all. Yeah, it we're is. in week two. Yeah, so, so. it's it's still kind of adjusting to it, so it feels a little bit longer than maybe mm-hmm. what we had over the summer. But we're we're there. Yeah, it's all good. Well, can I tell you something funny? Sure. Last night at Edge, the kids had to draw superheroes and create their own superhero. Mm-hmm. Let me just tell you, you see the difference between males and females real fast. So the guys, you know, I'm going to start with the girls. The girls created a superhero named Penelope with a cowboy hat, and she was preppy Amish. And she had the power to convert people to Catholicism. And on her cowboy hat was a tiara where tiara, tiara, (laughs) tiara, vase, vas, caramel, caramel. Anyways. This tiara had a little spotlight that would shine on the person (laughs) and then they would be experiencing the love of God that would lead them to this conversion. And she had angel wings that could just fly in your, like create this wind in your face so that you could see your Mm -hmm. sin. And, and it it was like, it was really intense. So that was the girls, the boys, Oh God bless the men. The boys decided on a superhero named Bolt, which they took from the movie. Yeah. After the dog. Right. And his... well, you know that the girls got Penelope from various cartoons and TV shows. Oh, for sure, for yeah. sure. And the fact there's that always, she was preppy Amish, that, yeah. that's a whole style that I'm unaware of. And apparently it's a style that a lot of kids talk about in school. So it's a thing. Things I didn't know that's going on in Fairfield Middle Schools. You know what? Here's the deal. There's just they're they're gonna be so many things that change constantly. It's not actually worth trying to keep up with all of it. No, not at all. You know, oh. <laughs> it, that thing is going to die within a year. But it, it's, okay, give so me some insight based on what the guys did. They named their their superhero Bolt. Bolt. Okay. okay. But here here was his characteristics. He was dumb. He was stupid. His only gift was athleticism. Other than that, they just kept repeating, and he's dumb, and he's stupid, and they're laughing hysterically as well, they're because giving the characteristics. They had the chance to <laughs> repeatedly say someone was dumb and stupid, which it's, it's middle school boys. That's still really funny. Oh, no, it was so dumb funny. and stupid. I was called a dumb, dumb head the other day by a two year old. And it was it was hysterically funny. You were called dumb, dumb. Head? Yes, dumb, dumb head. And it, <laughs> I, I, I laughed so hard because it's like his new phrase that he calls everyone dumb, dumb head. Did, did you ever and, watch the Night of the Museum? Uh, I have seen Night at the Museum. Yes. And you know that line, dum dum on gum gum. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but I just, I, I, I just, I thought the line was so funny. So here's the problem: when, when I'm with a family, when they have kids, and the kids say something like that, that's, mm-hmm. that's definitely not what the parents want them to say. Not the kind of thing they're trying to teach them to say. <laughs> they're, they're trying to teach them to be more appropriate and everything. Yeah. I'm the one laughing at it. <laughs> of course, like, you I are. Find, I find this hysterically funny. I'm a terrible example. Like. You, it's just not a good thing because I will, I will laugh. I will affirm the childish joke that your that your kid just made. I will, I will laugh at whatever silly thing they said, and yeah. that encourages them to continue doing it. Oh, for sure. So I will not discourage that kind of behavior because it, it, not deliberately. Yeah. You know, I just, I just laugh at it because it's funny. It's an authentic raw reaction. Exactly. That's what you're having. And I've got to learn, I've got to learn that deeper <laughs> self control because parents have it, and I admire them for having it. Like really, truly, I admire parents for being able to – teachers yeah. too. Yeah, that's true. Like teachers of, of younger kids, the younger grades, when, when those kids say things that are, are really funny, they've learned to to maintain the straight face. I can't do that. And it's it's a gift. It's a real gift. I, I admire that talent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So well, That's cool. Yeah, so that's boys and girls. I, I like the preppy Amish Penelope with the cowboy hat tiara. <laughs> no. <laughs> And the the wings that flap to make you see your sins. That's that's a fascinating one. Well, they, so today we're we're celebrating the feast of Saint Padre, Padre Pio, Pio yeah. who had that gift of reading souls. Yes. Right. I was yeah. listening to uh, to the radio this morning to a Catholic radio station, and they're they're talking about uh, this tendency that we have sometimes to examine someone else's conscience for them. Mm. Ooh. So in other words, take out the. It's like so if, if I'm eye. if I'm angry at you. 
Oh, what I'm you, doing is I'm I'm really examining your conscience mm -hmm. on your behalf, but you don't know that I'm doing that. Yeah, you're not supposed to do that. Right, exactly. <laughs> and they're talking about how unhelpful that is on a spiritual, which is totally true. It's yeah, not yeah. helpful at all. But wow, yeah. How how often is that the tendency? But I'm thinking of these angel wings now that that Penelope has, and how they flap in front of someone's <laughs> face and shows them their sins. It's not so much Penelope examining their conscience for them, but helping them to have their conscience revealed. Yeah. In their own hearts. So Listen, that they can it got really deep for a That's group a, of seventh grade girls. It's a good it's a good superhero. I'm I'm gonna yeah, Did I say she could fly? Things. You did, yeah. Well I assumed with the angel wings at least. Well, yeah. at first there was no flight and then it was discussed and a little argued about a bit and then it was added in there. Look, I mean, in in any debate about what kind of superpower you would have, there's there's often a question of would you rather be able to fly or do something else? It's very rare that that flight is assumed with mm. a superhero, mm -hmm. right? There's there's usually some other power that they have, and and then one or two others have the power of flight. Yeah, uh, but they might be lacking one of the other powers to to have that full combination. I mean, that's Superman, and <laughs> we kind of know Superman can do all it's, these great things. It's Superman. awesome, right? Exactly. Uh, but that's yeah. Kind yeah. Of, so that was my evening. That all checks out pretty well. Uh, yeah, you're right. He's dumb and stupid. Listen. <laughs> There is a difference between male and females. Like, <laughs> I don't know what else we want to say about it, but it is very evident to me every week. Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 And it's yep. awesome. It's awesome to watch. It's fantastic. All right. So we were talking the other day. Yeah. And we got into this whole conversation that I was really excited about. We're going to try to recreate some of that here because it'll be fun. Yeah, it was good. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about about rules and why why we have rules. Rules and laws and obligations and rights oh, and my goodness yeah it's so cool so I, I got to think about this because I've, I've noticed sometimes that we have a tendency to to forget what those rules and obligations are or why they're why they're present um, that we as as members of the church have certain things that we are responsible to do so for example I'm I'm a priest I'm a pastor as priest and pastor I have certain responsibilities to the people mm -hmm. I am responsible for praying with them and for them for celebrating the sacraments for them uh, I am responsible as pastor for ensuring that at least once every week a mass is offered for the intentions of the parish for the people um, now that's not the mass offered every day but like to make sure that a mass is being celebrated mm -hmm. each week for the people of the parish hmm. so anytime you see in, for the intentions of all parishioners yeah. that's that's I didn't mess. realize that had to be a weekly thing. Yeah. And if cool. it's if it's not a listed one, then I have to do it privately. Yeah. I have to make sure that I'm that I'm mm. offering mass mm. for the people. How do we get to this discussion? We were we were talking. Uh, I played devil's advocate in this conversation. <laughs> Typically. That's great. <laughs> well, we got into the into the conversation. Actually, I was talking about my plan for a series of of bulletin columns. Just some stuff that I, I want to write about to explain some some things that, that we have to, yeah. to be aware of because a lot of times people people don't know this stuff. Uh, we're living in a culture that's no longer got a, a strong foundation in the Catholic faith, mm -hmm. whereas back several decades, a couple generations ago, the idea that there was a, a sense and an understanding of, of what a Catholic's responsibilities in the world were uh, was simply known. Yeah. Uh, from a young age, children were taught what they had to do as as Catholics. Mm -hmm. And the positive side of that was they had an understanding that they were obliged to, for example, go to Mass. Mm -hmm. They had an understanding that they had to get married in the Catholic Church. They had an understanding that they were responsible for raising their children Catholic. Mm -hmm. They understood that if they wanted to marry someone who was not Catholic, they needed to go and talk to the priest mm -hmm. and find out what they had to do and how to do it. So th there was there was a sense of what was supposed to be done. But over time, that sense of what I am supposed to do has faded. So we can get into. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop one on, go on for you, it. right? Okay. Go, go for so it. we 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 started to adopt culturally, mm -hmm. and this is this is not just as a as a Catholic church in the United States, but just culturally in America, especially starting in like the late '60s and everything. You get the student revolutions in in Europe, and the the whole upheaval of the of, of the, what the '60s are and all of our stereotypes mm -hmm. of the '60s and everything. Plus, you have the Second Vatican Council where there's there's a, a massive change taking place in the life of the church, mm. what's meant to be renewal, but in the context of this big worldwide cultural shift, you start to to see a revival of what's called antinomianism. Antinomianism—that's okay. a hard word to say. 
Yeah, so anti <laughs> tiara. <laughs> tiara. <laughs> so antinomianism is the idea that law doesn't matter. That yeah, the, that makes like sense. The rules don't are, aren't really that important. Yeah. Um, and now in a certain way, you can say, well, every every law, every rule has an exception or has a dispensation. There are ways in which we can work within the law. Mm-hmm. Um, there are ways in which we can not focus so much on exactly what the rules are, but antinomianism has a tendency to say the rules don't matter at all. This isn't important. Who cares? Yeah. And when you do that, you start to fall into this idea that, uh, well, if, if none of this matters, then why would I, for example, go to mass on Sunday? Right. If I don't really need to go to mass, if, if the mass can be turned into whatever I want it to be and I can add and subtract from the mass as much as I want, Mm -hmm. then who really cares about going? Yeah. If I can make the mass look just like anything else, well, eventually I'm going to start to think that mass isn't that important. Likewise, if, uh, if I keep seeing on TV that there's these people getting married in vineyards and, uh, in their backyards and I start to really just think that's, that looks so great. And I I want to do that. And I don't think the church's law that I have to get married in the church really matters. Mm -hmm. Then you start to see people not getting married in the church. Mm-hmm. And then they start to not baptize their kids. They start to think, oh, this this doesn't really matter all that much. Right. But the thing is that it, it does matter. But it, it matters not because it helps us because we're following the law. Right. It, it matters because the law is pointing us to something much, much bigger. And this is where we can kind of get confused. Mm-hmm. Because the temptation is to think, well, aren't we just being too legalistic? And that's a lot of the critique is Catholics, you have way too many rules. You are like the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Sure. Like you guys are all about these things. Like, do you have to do this obligation? Yeah. Well, that just sounds like, like why? And so people right. will want to go Catholic light in other ways. Like, well, this is great because I don't have to do as many things. I always think that the, the idea that, oh, you Christians or you Catholics in particular, you have too many rules. It's, yeah. it's all about rules. And I, I don't want my, my kids to be obsessed with, with rules. Mm-hmm. Well, what if you took out Christians or Catholics from that statement mm-hmm. and said, uh, you soccer leagues are all about rules. Mm. You have too many rules. I don't want my kids to, to be obsessed with rules. Or you music teachers, you're, you're so obsessed with, with rules of, of music. Mm. Uh, I don't want my kids to be obsessed with rules, so I'm not going to let them play music. Mm-hmm. Um, Add almost anything in there, you know, oh, this workplace, I don't want this job because there's just too many rules. <laughs> like, I can't believe they're going to expect me to wear pants every day or something like that. Like, <laughs> like of, of course there are rules. Of course there are things that govern what we do yeah. and we need them. Wait, what's the purpose of, what's the purpose of law? Right. For the good of society to uphold like the good of the people. Yeah. So law exists. That for the sake of the good order of society. Exactly. Yeah. If law exists for the good order of society, why is the good order of society something important? Well, the good order of society is something important because we are sinners. Mm-hmm. And if we are sinners, then we are imperfect. And that means that we tend towards doing things that we should not do that are not good for us, right. that are not good for others. If we have that tendency, that tendency towards sin, that tendency away from what's good, then there needs to be something that orders us to either prevent us mm-hmm. uh, or that tells us that these are the boundaries in which we can live. Yeah. So there's, you have positive law, you have punitive law, mm-hmm. you, have, you have law that, that serves different purposes. When you have those rules and those boundaries, it helps you to actually flourish. Mm. I know who I am. I know what I'm about. I know what I am supposed to be. Yeah. That, I had one example that was given to me when I was in college. And it was like kind of, let's say you're on a castle. In a castle. In a castle. No, no, on top. Like you're at like a tower or something. Oh, okay. You're at like the top of a tower. And you're just seeing this beautiful stuff. But the rules and the laws are like is the fence that's keeping you from falling off the castle, off the tower. Mm. So it, it, in a way- Can I tell you a terrible fear that I've had like my whole life? Falling off a cliff? Uh, not falling off a cliff. I am, I'm not afraid of heights themselves, although if it's really tall, I'll start to feel a little bit dizzy, but I'm not afraid of heights. But I've had this, this fear uh-huh. that if I'm up on like a really high point somewhere, um, I will have a sudden moment of utter insanity <laughs> and I'll jump. What? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've experienced this fear in, in my life where I go like, what would happen? Oh my goodness. What, what, what would happen if I suddenly went insane and jumped? Why would I do that? I, I don't want to do that. It's, it's this I've weird, it's this weird fear that will happen. That. Yeah. Yeah. That's so I'm weird. not afraid of heights though. 
okay, well, we're going to make sure the, the, the fences are higher for you. Um, <laughs> but the, for me, that, that thing was very helpful. That image was here. God wants to give me like this, this vantage point, this viewpoint of like seeing everything, but at the same time being able to run freely in the space that I've been given. Mm. So as to protect me, because if there is no fence around me, I'm well, I know that I would be paralyzed to kind of sit in like one area or I could be tempted to just kind of look over and then like, you know, I would fall. But there's something about the barrier that gives me this degree of safety to really be there in that moment, but to explore it. You're like, you're living in this place of freedom. We think that when we have too many laws and too many, um, too many of those things in our life, it's restricting our freedom, which is interesting. And I think a lot of that has to do with American culture in particular is so interesting, even just looking at the roots of it historically. Uh, So I remember learning when there was settlement in New England and you had the Puritans, Um, but then there were particular people in these colonies or in these, in these communities that didn't want to stay in that. So they moved to Vermont and Vermont is the way it is because of the people who first settled it. Mm -hmm. They wanted to live away from laws and order. And, um, it just was like, I want to kind of be my own person. And you kind of see like almost 200 years later, Vermont still kind of is the same. Yeah. In the same way that it was settled. It's the, the, Themes still continue. Mm-hmm. Why am I hitting everything? Because you're having a hard time today. Jeez, I'm but having like, a hard go, time. Go west, for example. Yeah. Right? So think of the old Wild West. Mm-hmm. The, the idea of the Wild West is that there were no rules. Yeah. This is just kind of a lawless society. But even there, even in those places that seem to be rejecting law at all at all costs, they are still bound by something. Yeah. So we talk about you know before we even get into the idea of of a written law or a code of law, we talk about the natural law. Mm-hmm. So there's the laws of nature. And then there's the natural law. Yeah. And so the laws of nature and, the, and natural law are, are distinct in mm-hmm. that the laws of nature govern physics and biology. Right. Right. These are things that are, are beyond us completely. But natural law is sort of that that inner moral law that's that's written into us. Right. Um, so there are certain things that are, are natural to us that are, are, are our natural state. It's so good is you could just go right to Aristotle and he writes all of this. Stuff. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, so the, it, it's the part Greeks of the, understood this. This they, was long, this predates Christianity. Completely, yeah. completely. Like there is something written in our humanity that just knows. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there, there are certain things like we are, we are ordered to certain things. So like my heart is going to beat and it's going to pump blood through my body. Mm-hmm. Um, that's by nature. That's what the heart does. Yeah. And so there are things that, that it has to do that the heart must obey that natural law. It can't do anything else. Mm-hmm. Right. Then you have that natural law that's written in our heart that suggests to us, whether we're religious or not, that for example, uh, punching people for no reason is bad. <laughs> that, that killing is, is wrong, yeah. that there's, there's something wrong with deliberately deceiving another person, mm-hmm. that there's something wrong with stealing what belongs to another person. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's also something written in our hearts that suggests that when we see someone in need, we should help them. That that's, that's part of our nature. Our human nature actually functions that way. Yeah. It's ordered and to the good. Because we can think of things, not just on a, an instinctual level, we are also able to think of things on a philosophical level, on a spiritual level. Mm-hmm. We're able to to recognize in another person their need and therefore our responsibility to serve them, to guide them, to help them. Mm-hmm. Right. With that, then we can go further. When we look at the laws that the church has or the the commandments that right. God gives to us. Yeah. Right. If you look at the commandments, first the commandments, the first tablet of the law of the the Ten Commandments are our responsibilities to God. Mm-hmm. in our relationship with God. And then the second tablet of the law is our responsibilities to one another, mm. to humanity. Then from those 10 commandments flows all the other commandments of the Old Testament, the whole rest of the of the Jewish law and, and what's going to happen and how this is going to work. Then we have Christ coming and saying, I'm not getting rid of the law at all. Yeah, Nothing from the law and the prophets is going to be changed. Yeah. I've come to fulfill it. And you start to see then that that sense of obligation, I must do this, is now transformed into when I live according to the law, I live in freedom. Right. I live the way that God intends me to live, and that gives me peace. That gives me so this uh, is where a I've sense of who I am. Devil's advocate is how is that different now where the way the church exists is not the same and and to a degree 
to where it was around where Jesus founded it, mm-hmm. you know, or to the early Christians. You look at our stuff like, man, we have a lot of things that are rules that have kind of come up over the course of 2000 years. Yeah. So how do you reconcile with that? Because I'm like, well, then, I mean, I just yeah, playing devil's advocate. like, well, we have more rules than what Jesus did. Like, why can't we just kind of do how they lived? Right. You know, where. Right. There's a, a comedian I, I heard recently and he was commenting on a news story where a guy was arrested for going into a church and climbing into the holy water font during mass and like taking his clothes off and taking a bath in the holy water font something something ridiculous and so as as he a very big bath yeah <laughs> he kind of explains what the uh, the well i think it was probably the baptismal font like they probably had one of those big baptismal fonts yeah. with running water and everything so the guy like climbed in there and okay. so the, the, this guy was arrested and he's he's just kind of reading the headline and then he just pauses and, and he looks direct, directly at the camera and he says, but where exactly in the Bible does it say that you can't do that? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> uh, and it was funny because this, this is definitely not a religious comedian at all. Yeah. But he, he's kind of, he's on to something. A, a lot of times he said, well, where does it say in the Bible that you can't do that? Well, it doesn't have to say it in the Bible that you can't do that because it follows from everything else that the Bible says. It follows from all the other very logical rules. So. God gave us reason. Mm-hmm. He gave us logic for a reason. That mm-hmm. there, there are certain things that we're just going to understand are implied by this. Now, of course, those who wrote scripture, the sacred authors, didn't have in mind every single situation. Right. 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 Um, they could not possibly have had in mind uh, social media when they wrote the Bible. Mm. <laughs> right. And and yet we can still apply biblical reasoning and uh, religious divinely revealed law to how we use different things. Mm-hmm. We can definitely do that, even though the Bible doesn't say anything about TV or mm-hmm. the internet. Right, but I mean, the Bible also says, like, there are so many things that are that have happened that are not written in here, for what is here isn't enough to contain everything. Right, the was, Gospel of John tells us that yeah. what Jesus did and all the different miracles and all the yeah. things that he taught could could fill the entire world with books and it still wouldn't it be sufficient. It still be enough, yeah. yeah. So when, when you're looking at this, you have to understand that Throughout history, every time a society comes together, Mm -hmm. rules must be established. Again, go all the way back to the fall of Adam and Eve. In our fallen state, in our sinful humanity, uh, we do not of our own just automatically do what's good and right. Sometimes we need to be told, and that's because— You don't say. (laughs) (laughs) That's because our relationship with God, broken by sin, is is now— we no longer have that same orientation towards the good right. that we had in the beginning. So w- when we're looking at this, we've got to understand that that piece. Every society, every society in history has had certain rules and customs. Whether they're written laws or something uh, unspoken, yeah. these are norms that we that we have. What's the purpose of of law really, though? The purpose of law really to keep order. It's not just to keep order, but to bind. Mm. Not to bind us to a, a burden, mm. but rather to bind us together. Mm. So the laws that we have hold society together. I was listening to a, a podcast on canon law, actually, and the, this priest, I'll put, I'll put it in the show notes, mm-hmm. um, because there's there's a whole series, like I think it's 20 different podcast episodes that he did, just giving the overview of the church's law. Oh, wait, that's really cool. Really cool, yeah. Oh, I'll and listen to that. They're yeah. not super long. He's, he's actually really interesting. Um, it's, it's a little bit nerdy. In the sense it's that fine. this is a guy teaching canon law and you kind of have to be in the mood to, to dive into that. But it's, it's really cool yeah. when you realize what the church's law is all about. But he makes this point that the purpose of law is to bind us. Hmm. The purpose of law is to bind us together. It's to bind society together and not in a, an oppressive way, mm-hmm. but in a way that allows us to live and to flourish as we're meant to. Mm. So this whole this whole idea of the law it's it's for for unity. Which goes back to our conversation last week with Caroline when we were saying like what religion is it's meant to bind. So like the law of religion is meant to bind you. Okay. Yeah. Is, so these like the yeah. 10 commandments are meant to bind us in a relationship with God. Right. It's a covenant. Right. We enter into this covenant with God by following these these laws. We're holding up our end of the bargain. Yeah. Right. We're doing the things that God asks us to do. It's not always easy, and sometimes it don't, doesn't always make sense. And when we get into the idea of, of obligation, especially understood in a modern sense. Right. It's it's terrible because the amount of conversations that I've had with people who are Christians who are non-Catholics, um, not all of them, but some of them will kind of say, like, 
why do you have to do all that? Like Jesus just loves you. This is true. Jesus definitely loves me. But what's interesting is as you, as I've grown in a personal relationship with Jesus, I don't have this, I don't have this animosity towards the laws of the church. Like I now receive them as gifts. I experience them right. as gifts. I don't experience them as burdens. But as I enter into the life of the church and abide by um, just the, I don't want to say rules, but it's kind of like you're part of a family. And in the family, there are rules in order for you to live freely in relationship with people. And in that, you live your life in a really authentic way, in a very free way, and you have a home. Right. And so my own understanding of the laws of the church no longer were like attributed to a tyrannical dictating God, but because I began to understand God as father and he's a good father who disciplines his children, as it says in scripture, um, it's all coming from this place of me being formed greater into his image, but so that I have the freedom to love and be loved and and just receive that but to receive everything as a gift. Right. So the life of the church over the last 2000 years is a gift to the people. But going back to this thing that I always repeat, rules without relationship lead to rebellion. Right. It's like, that's, that's right. why. And so people get so inundated with the rules that they have to follow. Um, and so when, when, yeah. when there's a, an emphasis either on the emphasis is on obligation or yeah. when, one does not understand what obligation actually means, right? Then there's a, that tendency to rebel. So if I'm just telling you all the time, this is what you must do. You're you're obligated to this, and if you don't follow these rules, then you're you're not good. And as somebody in 2021, you would hear that, and you're like, ew. Well, it, it, be, it becomes a, a sort of pressure. Like, yeah, it oh, does. Wait a second, I'm I'm trying my best, mm -hmm. and so there can be a, a feeling of I'm not being met. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not understood. Uh, there can be a feeling of of why would you put this on me. That's really hard like to do. Like you're enforcing do. this right. onto me. On the other hand, if, if I hear that there's a, there's an obligation. So for example, the obligation to go to mass on Sundays and Holy Days. Mm -hmm. um, and I go, well, I don't, I don't believe that that's my obligation. I don't, I don't believe that I have to do that. And I can just reject it then as, as some, I, well, I don't think that really applies anymore. Yeah. Well, then you're rejecting the idea of obligation, but let's go back to obligation. Right. right? We tend to think of obligation first as a heavy burden. Right. I must do this thing that I would otherwise not want to do. Mm -hmm. But think of the phrase much obliged. I don't really think about it much, but do tell. Well, I am much obliged. Yeah. Much obliged is a way of saying thank you. Mm. And much obliged means that you have mm. done something for me. Mm -hmm. You've done something for me that now puts me in a relationship with you. Mm. And because I'm now in this relationship with you, there's something that I must give to you. I have to, I have to support you. I have to help you. There is much that I have to give to you because you have given to me mm. because you have done something for me now in return as a sign of us being in this relationship, I've got much that I have to give to you. Mm. I am much obliged to you is not negative ever. Nobody ever says that in the negative. That's awesome. I'm obliged to you because you've done something to me. Well, it comes from the same the same root word to, to be bound. Yeah. So religion binds me to God. Mm -hmm. It renews my covenant with him Yeah. to be obliged mm. like religare versus obligare means now we're in this relationship. That's so cool. Right? So I have this relationship with you that requires me to give something back to you. <laughs> to, so an obligation is actually an extremely positive thing. And it's a sign of a relationship. It's a sign of love. This is why language is important. Language matters so much. And actually this is, this language is one of the cool things. Right? They, they talk about this in the, uh, in this, this priest talks about it in his canon law stuff. He says, one of the cool things in the Latin language that's distinct from some of the modern languages is that different words can mean the same thing the way we would translate it, yeah. but has a different connotation. Yeah. So he talks about the, the word use in Latin, which means law, and the word lex, which means law. Oh. But lex is a written law. Yeah. This is something that has been written down a particular statute, whereas use 
speaks more to the whole body of laws that exists. Mm -hmm. And so that gets you into the whole philosophical idea of why are laws? Mm -hmm. Why do laws exist? And we go back again to laws bind society together and help us to order our lives correctly. Particular laws, the lex, that gives us this is the thing that we're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. This is the very specific thing that it applies in these particular cases. But two different words that we have one word for in English. Because English law. sucks. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty... Don't say that to English teachers. They they they, they really love the. <laughs> oh, but even and you even you wanted then, to be an English teacher, but yeah. Yeah, but even then, like we in English can express the same idea. We have to use more words to do it. We do. In Latin, it's kind of fun because one word carries with it all these other yeah. things, all these other ideas. So there's a simplicity to it mm-hmm. in that we only need the one word to describe it. But then there's a richness when we try to express it in English that says, okay, here's all the things that we have to say with mm. this. But that can make us talk a lot. Right? <laughs> but so Don't Americans talk a lot already? We do, yeah. <laughs> but let's, go, let's go back to this idea of, of the obligation, right? Because obligation is not meant to be a negative idea. No. So yeah. w- when we say we have an, an obligation to God to go to Mass every, every Sunday and on Holy Days of Obligation, it's... It's meant to be for all that God has given to us. Yeah. We are in a relationship with him because of what he has given to us. And our return to God is to go and be with him. It's to to renew this covenant with him. It's to go again and again and again right. to receive. So the, the idea of obligation is not, it's not meant to be negative. It's av- actually meant to be entirely positive. Yeah. And because we're in this covenant, Just as in a contract, right? If I have a legal contract with you, there are certain things that you have to do and certain things that I have to do. Mm -hmm. And if you break the contract, if you don't hold up your your end of the bargain, uh, I'm allowed to to take all your stuff, right? (laughs) Or or I'm allowed to sue you or I'm allowed to Mm -hmm. to receive some sort of recompense. Mm -hmm. Whereas the the covenant, the difference with a covenant is that it's it's meant to be a mutual understanding and in a spiritual way. And the difference is that in our covenant with God, Whatever part of the covenant we fail to uphold, God still is faithful. He is still faithful. Yeah. Exactly. He, right. he continues to hold up his yeah. end of the covenant. And the, the deeper part of a covenant is that it's an exchange of persons. Right. So it's like I give my heart to yours, you give your heart back to mine. So it's not just like about what we get out of God. Right. But And I think where a lot of the antinomianism comes from mm-hmm. is the idea that obligation is only understood in the negative. Right. It is. And so it's a burden. This is what I have to give. I'm just forced to give something to God. So my freedom is being violated. Yes. I am being forced to go and do something that I don't want to do. I had do. this middle schooler ask me like, why does God always ask to be worshiped? Like, and I was like, yeah, he sounds kind of egotistical, egotistical, doesn't he? And she was like, yeah, it's weird. But then we had a really good discussion about it. Um, that we were actually made to worship. And if we're going to, if we're not going to worship God, we're going to worship something. We're right. going to worship TV, um, all these different idols in our life. So the reason the command is there is because this is what you were created for. So in a way, like, yes, you do come with a manual. Um, but if you live outside <laughs> you come with a manual, that's great. Well, yeah, it's the Bible. <laughs> the Bible tells you how to live. Right. Um, and it, even I was talking to a young adult a while ago and she was just like, wow, the Bible really tells you what to do. Like it tells you how to live. I was like, yeah, it's kind of, yeah. God wrote it. But more, more importantly too, is And I remember this is something that I said to you when we were talking in your office. I was like, that's right. Like the commandments are there because God commands our joy. Mm -hmm. Like he's like, I command you to be joyful. I command you to be free. I command you to be whole. Like, ah, that, that, that's what God is speaking through the church is, is this invitation. But imagine like father Sam, I command you to be joyful. That that's completely different right. when we just look at the word command and we just think of it a negative connotation. But now it's like, wait, it's understood as the Lord wants my freedom so much that he made it a rule that I am supposed to be happy and in eternal bliss with him. Like it's my inheritance. Um, so when you look at then the laws that the church has, the canon law, so mm-hmm. um, canon comes from, this is another thing that the this priest says in his podcast, again, check the show notes and, and listen to this first episode of his podcast. It's fantastic. But he talks about the canon. Is mm-hmm. a, it comes from the Greek word. And it originally was used in the Iliad oh. by Homer. And it was used to describe the supporting structure. So the support structure 
is, is meant to, to oh, give like us some, the so, canon of scripture, the right. canon, canon exactly. of, oh, it's all coming and together. And so when, when we use it, we talk about the canon of scripture. These are the books that make up the Bible. The this is the support books. structure. Yeah. We talk about the canon of the mass. This mm. is the, the what we call now the Eucharistic prayer, but the canon of the mass is the part of the mass that does not change. Mm. It is always this piece. Mm -hmm. So all many other things surrounding the mass or other parts of the mass might be changed, but this fundamental structure always remains and can't be changed. I have, I'm sorry. Yeah. I have a question. Go for it. It's a devil is advocate question. Okay. What do you say to those people who might refer to this part in scripture where it says you shall not take away or add to what was said? I think this is in revelation. Yeah. That we can't, we can't take away from, from scripture. We can't add to scripture. Yeah. Right. How do you take that with the life of how the church has grown? Does that make sense? So in other words, here's what scripture says. We're not supposed to take away or add to it. Um, but then the express, like, I'm trying, I'm trying to say. Well, so the, the, the phrase you shall not take away or add to yeah. applies to the scriptures. Okay. Just to the scripture. Yeah. All right. Cause uh, this is why I'm asking the question because yeah. somebody might be thinking this, and I was like, no, I course, was thinking of this. Course. So the, the, then, the church's laws and the church's rules are about the the structure of what now has been given to us. Okay. How are we going to use it? But the scriptures are the thing that don't change, right? The scriptures <clears throat> are, the, are the things that we continue to use, mm -hmm. that we continue to read, that we continue to reflect upon. Mm -hmm. So all the laws of the church, if you if you really get into it, you'll see that all the laws of the church are going to refer back in some way to, to what the scriptures tell us, to what divine revelation tells us. So even though canon law, properly speaking, is not theology itself, mm -hmm. there's a theological dimension to it. But there's also, this is just for the good ordering of different things. So as a society comes into existence, as a society is brought to birth, at some point you have to start ordering things. Now, some of those things are like, hey, we've sensed the Holy Spirit prompting this in our lives. So over here, this uh, this community here wants to start doing something. All right, that's fine. But what are the rules for that? How is that community going to, going to do those things? Mm -hmm. What needs to happen? Um, the particulars. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And those particulars are, are really important. So as we start to look at that, then some, some rules have to come into play. Where are we going to get those rules? Well, those rules are going to be founded in our scriptural point. understanding. Mm -hmm. So we understand that this is how God's revealed himself. If we know that this is how God has revealed himself, we know that this is what Jesus taught, then any rule that we have has to be based on the teachings of Jesus. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. That's how it happens. So it's not about changing anything that scripture says, but rather about building off of what scripture has given to us, mm -hmm. not to say this is scripture because the laws of the church can change. The laws yeah. of the church are mutable. Interesting. Yeah. The laws of the church can, can be changed um, because they apply to a particular time and place mm -hmm. or they apply in, in a general circumstance. And if that circumstance disappears, then the law also would disappear. So going back to eighth grade history class. Yeah. <laughs> where I learned about the Catholic Church and they told me how horrible it was. Because <laughs> that's what they're teaching Send in public schools. Send your kids to Catholic school. <laughs> <laughs> Ugh, yeah. So um, I remember them kind of saying, like, indulgences. Were, was that a law? Like, is in the history of the church, are have there been laws that have been... Um, Yes, that they're, yeah, they're, they're unjust and, and so for example, the the idea of the indulgence yeah. remains. Yes, so the it indulgence does. is is a spiritual reality. Yeah. The indulgence is not is not legal per se, but that the church, with her authority to uh, to to govern, with her authority to teach, with her authority to sanctify, mm -hmm. the idea of the indulgence is by by doing these prayers, the church, by her own authority given to her by Christ is going to grant you some spiritual favor. Mm. And so we believe that God, through the ministry of the church, grants these favors. That's what every sacrament is, right? Yeah. By, by God's grace, through the life of the church, through the ministry of the church, gives us something that, that we need. And so mm. in giving us that thing that we need, um, God is able to, to provide something. So the idea of indulgences, that actually still exists. Yeah. The idea of selling indulgences for a monetary fee was never part of the church's uh, was never part of the church's law. Right. That was a practice that sprang up. And in fact, that's part of the reason that the, the Reformation happened was because you, you can't do that. You can't sell these things. Of course, of course. Um, an indulgence is something that's done by, by your own prayer and by your works of charity. To say that you can buy one is, is incorrect. Mm -hmm. And that there were people doing that, selling indulgences for really for their own profit yeah. uh, was an abuse of the, uh, the very idea of an indulgence. So I think, I think what a lot of people might have to do then is understand 
that mm, maybe what you think about the church and what you think about the laws, um, revisit them in, in, in a sense, because we, a lot of, might have misconceptions of what the, what the church actually asks of us. Sure. Um, well, let's just look at a couple things. Then, yeah. Right. So a, a few things that the church asks of us to do. The most obvious one is to go to mass. What happens when, when we go to mass? We receive the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. We are given Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity to, to dwell with us, to stay with us. We're bound to a community of others who believe. Mm -hmm. And so we are introduced then into a, a community that will support us, that will be with us. We're shown that we have spiritual companions as we go through this journey of life. So the idea that we have an obligation is, is not like, yeah, if you if you don't fulfill this obligation, that makes you a terrible person. But this is for your own good. And when we fail in our own obligations to ourselves, we have to be able to recognize that something's wrong. Mm. You know, so if I if I if I abuse drugs, I'm failing in my obligation to myself yeah. to take care of, of, of my own body. If I'm not eating well, I'm failing in my obligation to myself. It's not good for me. Mm -hmm. Right. And I know that it's not good for me. If I'm indulging in some other habit that I know is not really going to be good for me, I'm hurting myself. But by extension, I'm going to start to hurt other people, too. Yeah. Even if it remains an entirely private affair, eventually it's going to start to affect my relationships, my friends. Yeah. It's going to affect my family. And so I have an obligation, even just to myself, mm -hmm. to eat well, to do these right things. Well, the same thing is true spiritually. We have obligations in our spiritual lives. And those obligations are both to God and to ourselves. If I refrain from going to Mass, first and foremost, I'm hurting myself. Mm -hmm. I'm hurting myself because I'm not availing myself of, of the grace and the presence of God. I'm not, I'm not allowing myself to share in the graces of, of community life and mm -hmm. of, of family. And then not only am I not availing myself of those graces and those blessings, I'm also depriving the rest of the community of my presence. Which why in Acts 2.42, it literally says they came together for the breaking of the bread, which is mass, for the teachings of the apostles, which is the, you know, the teaching body of the church, for prayer and intercession and for fellowship, yeah. community. Like those are the marks of the church. Yeah. Well, so those four things. Right before we started recording, yeah. a woman came into the office and she looked at me and she said, Father, you missed Mass today <laughs> because I was not the celebrant of the morning Mass at the parish. Today I had another priest who covered, which was great. It's really helpful to have that. Yeah. But she said, Father, you missed Mass today. Mm. Now, Mass was said. Today is not a holy day of obligation. It was fine that another priest celebrated the mass. And she was teasing me uh, about missing mass. She wasn't being serious at all. She you was should just have teasing prefaced me. that. Yeah, no, she was just was teasing like, me. Does someone just come and like, but, <laughs> come at you? But again, so there, but there's a spiritual reality under that. As pastor, as, as a spiritual father to this community, I have a certain obligation to be there mm -hmm. and to be part of this. I also have an obligation when I cannot be there to make sure that somebody covers that mm -hmm. the mass is still is still celebrated mm -hmm. but there, there's this important piece that she was hinting at in a joking way yeah but that she was hinting at that you know I, I belong there yeah and that she wanted me to be there so there's a beauty to that right yeah. it's also just teasing and, and perfectly oh, fine and innocent sure. it was great so there, there's that part of the obligation that actually binds me in a really beautiful way to a, a bigger community to something bigger than than just myself all right then look at some some of the other obligations right but also rights. This yeah, we want to, we got to talk about we rights. We got to talk about rights. Yeah. So for example, a Catholic has the obligation to get married in the Catholic church to receive the sacrament of matrimony. But a fully initiated Catholic also has the right to get married in the Catholic church, mm -hmm. provided they're not bound by some prior sacramental bond of marriage, mm -hmm. right? They have the right to marriage. Yeah. And that's an important piece. They have a right to marriage. They don't necessarily have the right to marry on whatever day they, they choose. For example, uh, you, you know, you can't get married on uh, a day when, when the priest is not available to do the wedding, right? Right. Like if the calendar's already full, the priest is going to say, hey, I'll, I'm sorry, you can't do it then. He's not denying your right to marry. Yeah. He's just saying on this particular day, it's not going to be possible. Mm -hmm. right? uh, but you have the right to marriage. Now, here's the, the fun thing. You have to get married in the church, mm -hmm. inside, yeah. before the altar, right? Not in a meadow, in a field. Right. Which a lot of people really get confused about. And it's like, 
Exactly. But well, and, and here's here's part of the reason it. that they that they get confused. Number one, they see it on TV or in movies all the time. Yeah. Number two, they see that sometimes mass is celebrated outside. I have seen that. Right. Literally. Or they'll or they'll see that um, there's a you're at a youth event, right? And there's yeah. priests scattered all over the the grass hearing confessions. Mm -hmm. Why can confession be heard outside? Mm. Well, so this is this is where it gets really fun, mm. right? Okay. All right. So think about it like this. First of all, let's let's start with those other sacraments that can be celebrated outside of the church, such okay. as confession or anointing of the sick, or even in emergency cases, baptism. Mm, Why true. can you go and do these things outside of the church, outside of a consecrated space? Because, especially with confession and with the anointing of the sick, we're talking about sacraments of healing. healing yeah. So it's bringing God's grace to the world in whatever place that needs to happen. Mm. Now, confessions obviously can be celebrated in the church. Anointing of the sick can obviously be celebrated inside the church in those consecrated walls. But they can also, those are sacraments that can also be celebrated elsewhere because mm. we're bringing God's healing into a world that needs healing. Mm. Baptism can be celebrated outside of the church because there are times when that saving grace that washes us clean of original sin mm -hmm. is needed outside of the church. Yeah. The idea of bringing the child to the church is to take a child out of the world and into this consecrated space. Oh, that's so so cool. even like, for example, if I've baptized a child outside of the church and I have a few times mm -hmm. uh, when that's necessary, if everything works out well and the child lives, we come to the church and we do everything that we couldn't do in the emergency. Mm. In the moment of the emergency, you need water. I need to, you need to pour it three times over the child's head and say, yeah. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And guess what? Anyone can do that. Yes. Anyone who I intends do to that. do what the church does can do that. You don't need the priest to come and do it. So if ever there's that situation, take water, pour it three times over the child's head saying their name, I baptize you in the name of the That's Father so and awesome of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's so awesome that we can do that though. Like it's, baptized people can baptize people. Yeah. Non-baptized people can baptize people. Really? As long as you intend to do what the church does, which is to baptize. Why would a non-baptized person, wait, wait, how does that work? Let's say there's a, a, a Jewish doctor okay. and there's a child in danger of death oh. and he's the only one who knows how to do it. Wow. He can do it. Really? Yeah, as long as he intends to do what the church does. Wow. Which is to baptize. You don't even need to be a person of faith necessarily to do it. Whoa, wait, that's so amazing. Yeah, yeah. well this is, this is again, wow. re like remembering that God's grace works through many different channels. Yes. We have the guarantees of how his grace works through the sacraments right. and through the teaching authority of the church, through the ministry of the church. We also have those ways in which God is not limited by yeah, he's not bound those by the sacraments. channels. Yeah. I remember when you said he's, that to me. Yeah, he's my, bound to the sacraments, but yeah. not limited or by, bound by, by them. them. Yeah. yeah. Again, this is where the English language starts to kind of fall flat because the of word bound, he's like he's not bound to the sacraments, but but he is bound to the sacraments in that when the sacraments happen, God's grace really so happens. Really, he's not bound by. Yeah. Bound by the sacraments. Yeah, it's yeah. it's really powerful. So in other words, th this idea that that a child needs baptism needs to be cleansed of original sin. That can technically be done anywhere. The, the ritual of baptism, bringing the child to the church, is done so that they're brought into the church. It's the, this idea of, of really being brought to God's grace and consecrated right. to God, right? So if we think of actually the, the idea of bringing a child to the church for baptism might be one of the best corollaries to marriage. Mm. Children exist by nature, right? They are a biological reality. Mm -hmm. Marriage is a natural institution. Before Christ established marriage as a sacrament at the wedding feast at Cana, when he performed his first miracle, his first public miracle is performed at the wedding feast, mm -hmm. indicating that marriage is something that is to be held sacred. Mm -hmm. Marriage is something that is to be sanctified. He takes water and changes it into wine. Water and wine always being that sign of his of his blood. It's prefiguring already his, his consecration mm -hmm. at at Calvary, yeah. when blood and water will flow from his side. Yeah, that's where the so church is born. So at the marriage feast at Cana, Jesus performs his first miracle. He's symbolizing the marriage between himself and the church. All these things are happening right in that in that moment. Marriage then becomes a sacrament because marriage mirrors the relationship that Jesus Christ has to his church. Yeah. All right. So when we talk about marriage being something that has to be done in the church, it's because this natural thing, this natural institution. Has been elevated. Exactly. And what do you see in a married couple? Well, they met and fell in love 
And before they got married, nature was already taking its course. Mm. They were falling in love in this human way. Mm -hmm. And their relationship, they're, they're being bound together more and more closely as their relationship grew, needs now to be elevated. Yeah. And so the idea of marriage in the church is to bring what is natural and make it supernatural. So dope. So Wait, we're, sit with that. That's so, like yeah. really amazing. So we are bringing yeah. what is natural, this natural relationship, and we're consecrating it to God so that it can become something that is supernatural. Same thing uh, when we bring a child into mm. the church to be baptized. This child, this natural being, is now being brought into the church to be consecrated to God mm -hmm. and to be made holy, to be sanctified, to become supernatural. Right. Then if you look at what, why can we celebrate mass outside? Because we can take what is supernatural and bring it back to the world, back into, back the, into the natural world. world. Yeah. So it's okay to go and celebrate mass outside because we're taking something supernatural, a supernatural celebration of God's grace, you know, heaven and earth meeting on the altar. Yeah. And we're bringing that into the world and so this can happen. Mm. But marriage, the idea of being married in the church, is taking what is natural and asking that it be made supernatural. So it has to come into that place that is set aside to be that meeting place yeah. of what is supernatural and what is natural. I, now, then, oh, Sorry, I'm going to just do okay, one, okay, one more thing. All right. Because... <laughs> I'm sorry, I really, like, really want to say what I want to say. But there I, are I, situations I, where it would be possible to have a marriage outside of the church, mm -hmm. outside of those four walls. But that's with the church's dispensation, the church okay. recognizing, no, there's something here. There's a desire for the sacrament here. And so we're going to give permission that this sacrament be celebrated. Mm -hmm. It's an extraordinary circumstance, but we recognize that desire for the sacrament. We know that the sacrament is going to take place. And so we give permission as the church. We extend mm -hmm. that authority. We extend that gift out. Mm -hmm. And so even in certain circumstances, the church can grant that permission. So with that, what I'm hearing at the same time, so everything's meant to be supernatural. It's supposed to point you to our head, towards heaven. Heaven is our inheritance. And even that simple act of that permission being granted by the church is saying, in a personal way, God is not holding back your inheritance. Like, this is your right. Like, this is what you, this is what's coming to you. We like the Lord wants you to have it. And because the church was founded by Jesus, like, it's a gift in which our inheritance is not being held back. Um, so I have an obligation to be joyful and free and whole. Um, but I also have a right to this inheritance. Yeah. That, that is the church. Yeah. And this is the thing. You have a right to it. Yeah. You have a right to receive this grace. Exactly. You have a right to have something natural in your life brought to the supernatural level. Yes. You have a right to be consecrated yes. in that way. Yeah. Ah, that was great. So there's a, there's a power there. Yeah. And again, I think the reason that we get into that antinomianism is because I'm thinking only in terms of obligation. Well, I don't feel like doing that. I don't want to have to do that. That limits my freedom. But if I understand that these laws, these rules are there not to oblige me in the negative sense, as in to put a heavy burden on no. me, these are here to bind me more closely right. and to be that recognition that I'm able now to recognize the gift that has been given. Right. I'm able to recognize that something has been offered to me that's a treasure beyond words. Yeah. And I want to be able to live in that gift. Yeah. Right. That's the power of it. Oh, it's so gosh. cool. It's so great. I was like when, when people say, I think priests should be, be able to get married. And uh, or, or when I was in seminary and they'd say, you know, you can't get married, right? Like, no, are you serious? <laughs> no kidding. Found out. Right. <laughs> I'm like, look, every priest on the day of his ordination, knows what he's getting into. Yeah. Like, we, we know what this is about. We know what this is. Yeah. And now here's the other thing. To freely refrain from taking what is your right. Mm. Before I was ordained, I had a right to marriage. That's true. Yeah. I have the I had the right to get married. I also, I did not have the right to become a priest. Mm. I was valid matter to become a priest, mm. a baptized Catholic man. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have the right to the priesthood because the church calls you to the priesthood. Mm. I had a, a right by nature to marriage. Mm. To become a priest, I recognized my right. I reckon to become a, a priest in the Latin right. I should be really specific. I recognized. <laughs> the Ukrainians take you. <laughs> exactly. I recognized what my right was. I knew it and I understood it. And I also recognize that just because I have the right to something doesn't mean that I must have it. 
Mm. There are plenty of rights that all of us have by yeah. law that we don't exercise. That's true. Right. I have the right to bear arms. I don't own a gun. I, I could if I want to. Mm -hmm. I have the right to, mm -hmm. according to the Constitution, but I don't feel like it. <laughs> So I'm not gonna, right? <laughs> uh, was that a pun? Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't intentional, but good, good job. I, I like that you caught that. Well done. No, that's how I but, listen to things. <laughs> but it is possible to, to freely abstain from a right in order to do something else yeah. that is also supernatural. Yeah. In order to receive something that is also supernatural. Receive that gift. And that's actually where we start to understand that if I'm going to do certain things, I, I must, and for the sake of good order, I must also refuse something else. Fulton Sheen talks about this, right? Yes. He talks about this when, when, he's, when he's writing about marriage in Three to Get Married. He talks about how uh, when John marries Susie, he's saying no. Mm -hmm. To everybody else. Exactly, because yeah. by saying yes to Susie, he is also saying no, no to everyone who is not Susie. Yeah. And there's a power in that, like this massive no in marriage. Yeah is for the sake of this one singular treasure, which is that yes to Susie. Mm -hmm. So when we look at what we're obliged to in the life of the church, these laws exist to give us that greatest of all yeses. Mm. So we have these, these obligations. These are, these are the things that we're supposed to do as faithful Catholics, but the, the laws are there not to limit our freedom, not to take us away, right. not to hurt us, not to impose a burden, but rather to help us live fully what we're supposed to be. Exactly. The problem is we don't see that typically in our civil law. We don't, we don't view our civil laws. This is the thing that's supposed to help me to really be who I am mm -hmm. because we think mostly in our civil law of things that are either going to remove my right to do something yeah. or that are going to impose a burden on me. Like because of civil law, I have to pay taxes <laughs> and I, I don't like that. I wish that I didn't have to, but the mm -hmm. law says that I have to. So it's, it's an obligation, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and then the, the laws that, don't do that, the laws that don't feel like they're a big burden, we tend to not even think about very much. Right. So there's a speed limit. You don't think very much about the speed limit unless you're you're speeding mm -hmm. um, or somebody's tailgating you. Yes. Otherwise, you don't really think very much about what the speed limit is. Yeah. Uh, you just kind of know instinctively that you're supposed to do it. It's almost like the speed limit is part of natural law. I just kind of know that I'm not supposed to do certain things. <laughs> like I know that it's not a good idea to drive down the post road in Fairfield at 70 miles an hour. Gosh. It might be really fun, but it's a terrible, terrible <laughs> might idea. Might be really fun. Might be. It's a, it's a very big might be. It's a, like a, a very <laughs> subjunctive sort of word right there. You know? So like these Next on things, the Fairfield patch. Yeah. <laughs> Fairfield priest found driving 75 miles an hour down Post Road. Oh my goodness. Past the police station. File that under all we need. <laughs> 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 Terrible. So anyway, like the, the church's laws are, are a reflection of divine law. Yeah. And those church's laws that are a reflection of divine law are meant to help us to thrive and to be free. Right. They're not meant to be this this big burden of something <clears throat> terrible. They're, they're meant to really be for our good. And they are. Yeah. And even like when laws began to be introduced in the early part of the Old Testament, you have to understand the context of that world. And if you listen to Babylon Ear, you will know this. But Father Mike will say it's because that world was so disorderly and so filled with violence. Yeah. It wasn't in the natural sense. It wasn't even ordered towards what was good. It was. And how many times has that been repeated, though, throughout human history? Mm -hmm. So you have the Israelites in their violent and disordered world. Yeah. But then almost every civilization has had at least some part of its its history that was yeah. violent and disordered. Yes. Yeah. And it just it keeps repeating. We start to see that. No, law actually is meant to help us. Right. And, and, it, and when law is realized in its fullness and its real potential, then that that help actually comes when it's abused. Right. When it becomes something that it's not supposed to be, we, we see what happens, too, because then you get totalitarianism and dictatorships. Yeah. You know? And going back to your point of being supernatural, like the law was there to set them apart. And so we have been called to be set apart for heaven, yeah. for the divine law. Right. Like that's but what for it's so for. many years as, as a church, we have we've forgotten to teach the, the positive aspect of what the law is. Yeah. And if the focus is only on on obligation, 
in the in the negative sense. You you have to do this. These are the rules that you have to follow. And if yeah. that's the only thing we're thinking about, then people will rightly say the church is obsessed with rules. But if we understand, no, the rules exist for this reason, and mm-hmm. we're able to explain both what the rule is and why it exists yes. and help people to recognize that it's about binding us closely in our relationship with Jesus Christ. It mm-hmm. points us to the heart of our Savior. Yeah. If we can understand that, and then we understand also that we are we are given freely these gifts of grace and not just given freely gifts of grace, but we're bound more closely in union with our heavenly father. Yeah. We're, we're invited into something that is really and truly powerful and beautiful. Then that, that idea of, of the law, we start to see it as something that's actually really for our good and for our benefit. We've got to change the narrative for people. Yeah. We've got to change that. We have that to reclaim idea. the word because it, it is, especially in some circles, tradition, religion, it, those yeah. Those are a reason why people leave the church, but it's, they were never taught what they were exactly. supposed to They're, mean. Typically, what you see is people who have walked away from something that they weren't—they were never given the real explanation. Right. They were never given the fullness of that truth. Right. We we have a Language responsibility to matters. help them. Oh, in a big way. Yeah. <laughs> Language but to matters. help them to see, like, actually, these these laws that the church have. <sighs> It's, it's for our good. It's yeah. to build us up and it's to help us to, to order our lives towards Christ. That's yeah. the whole purpose. It's not meant to take anything away. It's not meant to hurt us. It's meant to bind us more closely to Christ. Yeah. Amen. Well, this is, this was great. I like this. This, <laughs> this is, is fun. this was a good one. Thanks. Let me talk about this. Yeah, no, for sure. Cool. I thought it would be a great episode for today. <laughs> All right. This is Roar Like the Lamb. I'm Paula Pena. I'm Father Sam Kachuba. <laughs>